welcome back to It's an Inside Job podcast. I'm your host, Jason Lim. Now, this podcast is dedicated to helping you to help yourself and others to become more mentally and emotionally resilient so you can be better at bouncing back from life's inevitable setbacks. Now, on It's an Inside Job, we decode the science and stories of resilience into practical advice, skills, and strategies that you can use to impact your life and those around you. Now, with that said, let's slip into the stream. Well, here we are again at the starting line of a new week. Thank you for joining me and allowing me to be part of your week. When we talk about resilient relationships, whether that be privately or professionally, well, it comes down to the ability to have constructive conflict, to be able to talk about differing opinions, differing perspectives, to understand and explore points of view. If we are not able to do this, then our relationships will be brittle and fragile. So in this week's episode, we dive into the intricate world of conflict resolution, mediation, and negotiation with with the brilliant and vivacious Ines Khalifa. Based in Cairo, Ines brings over eight years of invaluable experience to our discussion, having worked extensively in diverse areas including mediation, conflict transformation, peace building, and tackling gender-based violence in the workplace. So today we will unravel the complexities of conflict, particularly in the context of the global south. Our conversation takes us deep into the heart of gender stereotypes and their profound influence on the power dynamics, cultural norms, and the delegation of power. We explore how these factors play a pivotal role in either igniting or extinguishing conflict on a personal or professional front. One fascinating aspect we will dive into today is the unique female perspective on the mediation negotiation process. You know, Ina shares her insights on how women navigate these challenging waters, becoming beacons of resilience and strength even in patriarchal societies. We discuss the strategies and the traits that empower women to rise above adversity and contribute to conflict resolution with a distinct perspective. Now, throughout this episode, we tackle thought-provoking questions that shed light on the nature of conflicts. Are conflicts truly constructive or dynamic? How do cultural norms shape the mediation negotiation process? What role do gender aspects play in both fueling conflicts and offering pathways to their resolution? You know, collective trauma, social code, and subtle nuances are not overlooked in our exploration. We unravel the role these often hidden elements play in the realm of conflict resolution, especially within the complex landscape of a workplace. Well, this episode promises a wealth of insights, eye-opening revelations, and practical wisdom for anyone intrigued to the dynamics of conflict, mediation, or negotiation. So without further ado, let's slip into the stream and meet Ines Khalifa. Oh, thank you so much, Jason, for having me today with you. It's an absolute pleasure. I am Ines Khalifa. I am mediation and negotiation consultant who is based in Cairo in Egypt. So basically I have been working in this mediation field the last 10 years in mediation and conflict resolution, peace building, negotiation, and my big passion goes to the track one peace diplomacy or the preventive or peace diplomacy. Maybe you can lead us through your background. What led you into sort of conflict resolution and media uh, mediation work? Well, that's a brilliant question because 12 years ago, I was invited to do like a summer school with United Nations Alliance of Civilizations at this uh, diplomatic academy in Malta, uh, Academy of Diplomatic Studies. And it was already on, on peace building in the Mediterranean, how to build peace in the in the Mediterranean regions. And then I was, I fell in love with this mediation. I get to know this before peace building, there's conflict resolution, right? And there's mediation and there's negotiations, diplomatic negotiations. And there are like different phases before we reach this phase, what we call like peace building. And then when I fell in love with this mediation idea, the track one peace diplomacy, uh, I applied for my master's degree and I got the, the, the privilege to be accepted in one of like German universities. Uh, it's called Otto von Gierig Universität in Magdeburg. It's one hour far from Berlin, where I completed my degree in mediation and conflict resolution with like two years of training on conflict transformation, 
um, gender-based violence, uh, cultural sensitivity, social inclusion, and like different types of mediation tracks and diplomacy. And I, I found your take on gender and conflict and, and the whole spectrum in which we'll dive into today very fascinating. Maybe we could understand a little more about conflict mediation. You know, conflict can have many negative connotations, but if we broaden the the latitude and the altitude of the definition of conflict, you know, would you consider it to be more constructive or dynamic in nature, or is it a little bit of both? I I, I need first to ha- to be clear about my definitions when I speak about conflict or conflict resolu- resolution. There is also a debate over this di- constructive conflicts. We always pose these questions: Are conflicts dynamic? Are they construct? Are they positive? I would say yes to to a certain degree or to a certain extent because uh, at workplace, for example, if I want to be more precise, if we have conflicts at workplace, which everyone has, everyone, it's a global uh, problem or a challenge. If if a conflict would lead me to sit on the table with, with my conflict parties and we would have a civilized and powerful and transparent conversation, and we are clear about our needs and our like demands, then I would I would consider this a very positive and constructive conflict. If this is going to lead me to reach a specific agreement, a fair agreement, or um, uh, if, if we are going to generate more respect for each others at this workplace through this conflict, then I would say, yes, it's very constructive and positive conflict. I don't like, what I don't like is when the conflict is excessive and extreme, as a, when someone is producing conflict, when I deal with high conflict personalities every day as a way of living or a lifestyle, I would say this is very, very toxic and negative. And we, we will have another debate over this, yes. You know, what I try to do is I bring, like to bring on varied voices onto the podcast, international per se, and not always just simply from the West, because I think there's such a broad spectrum of conversation and experience. And also yourself, who's been very international, working in many different countries, and myself, who works with multinational teams, there are sort of cultural norms that we all come from, depending upon our background or culture, what have you. And these will differ from region to region, of course. You know, how have you observed these cultural norms affecting the mediation and negotiation or conflict area of communication? And maybe you could provide some examples from your your own experience. Yes, this is very, very big and broad question. We could speak years and years <laughs> of cultural norms and, and nuances and codes and hierarchies because mm. you belong, of course, to the Western culture or the Western world where you are living in an egalitarian society, right? Mm. I would speak about me and you now if you allow me. And I come from Egypt, like the North Africa, where I belong to. Uh, and I have been doing my degree and I have been working abroad for almost 10 years where I have learned more and more about different types of, of doing things and different cultures. So when I speak about cultural norms, if I do cross-cultural negotiation, if I do mediation, if I even work with cross-cultural teams, mm. I need to be fully aware of the cultural norms, of the cultural mindset and the cultural map of the hierarchies in the society, of the gender stereotypes, of the religious background, if I have religious minorities with me in my team. Religious backgrounds, yeah. Yes, yeah. Religious, different diverse religious backgrounds, because if, if I belong to the dominant majority, for example, in any country, and we have a small uh, religious background, then they might feel persecuted or victimized, this victim narrative or, or mindset. Then they have to be fully aware not to touch on highly sensitive topics with people. And not to marginalize them, of course, to integrate them in my team. Uh, and there are different types of societies and cultures, right? There are egalitarian societies versus hierarchical. I belong to Egypt, the most hierarchical and patriarchal and classist society you can ever deal with, right? Where I, if I fight with a man at workplace or I argue with him, I have to put my gender, right? I want also to, to say that gender... I want to define it because this is big and fluid definition. Gender is not only being a a female or a male. 
Gender uh, is uh, simply def defined as socially and historically constructed roles in, in, in our societies, right? And which deep rooted and embedded in all like cultural mindset. Your role is to do this and this only because I am a woman and your role is to do that and that only because you are a man. And those are the gender stereotypes. So and is, just, let me just understand, but just to back up. So there are, there are the two genders, as you said, male and female, but the roles or the responsibilities of those genders, as we've stipulated, can and do differ from culture to culture. Is this what you speak of or is mine? They are different from society to another. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, of course. So uh, if you are in, in my patriarchal and hierarchical society and you are in a cross-cultural negotiation mission, for example, and you are negotiating with uh, a woman, then you have to be aware, how do people perceive me in this field, right? It's a male-dominated field. It is not like a female-dominated field. And then the age factor, because in Global South, I have like noticed that you will get more respect when you are a man. And if you are quite senior, quite old, then you will get more respect. Mm -hmm. So the age factor is very, very important. So I realized when I'm back to Egypt and I was working here, I realized that at my workplace, when I argue with a man, there's power relations. He has more power and more privilege over me. I will never win if I fight against him, right? Because mm -hmm. he's a man, he is old, uh, he has more power and more dominance at workplace, and you can't forget even to argue with him. So yes, indeed, cultural norms are very, very important in patriarchal societies. And you will have formal culture versus informal cultures, hmm. high context versus low context, egalitarian versus hierarchical. And you will have individualistic culture like the Western world versus this collective culture like global south, where we are very like fluid with time. If I speak about time fluidity here in, in Egypt, for example, hmm. if we agree to meet at like 2 p.m., People might come to you at four or five because it's for them perfectly normal not to be in time. I don't want to generalize, but I will be generalizing at the end about this big, huge majority that really of course. Don't. Yeah, this time restrictions really, where, whereas in the Western world is right. It's okay like to be on time or even before time, which I do. Yes, doesn't always mean yes. It could mean maybe here in Egypt, it could mean no. It could mm. mean yes, but sometimes yes is no here in Egypt. People will never tell you, "I sorry, I don't know. Like if you ask for directions, I was always lost when I came to Cairo. It's a huge city, mega city. And I asked, could you please explain this to me, this direction? People will never say, no, I don't know. He will tell you, oh, yes, I know the address. Go straight forward ahead. Take the first right, take the second left. And I did know somewhere there's this uh, shop and then you will find your address. I was always lost. And then when I had to, I, make, I made some realization and I found out this is a culture that you don't say, no, sorry, I don't know. This is impossible for lots of people here. For me, it's perfectly no normal to say, I'm so sorry, I don't know the address. And I, I think that's why, you know, understanding and having cultural intelligence, you know, along with emotional intelligence and what have you, is, yeah. I think it's a prerequisite to working in a multinational team. But... If we move it from the nation state and let's say move it to a company, a multinational company that in that meeting room, there's a num number of different, obviously, genders, male and female, plus there's a number of different nationalities and culture. Yes, each has specific cultural norms and that's perfect, all, perfectly all right where they are, of course, depending upon the nation. But in that meeting room, you know, how do we shift from cultural norms to more sort of team norms or that team's norms? I mean, from your experience, because when you bring people together, there's always going to be some level of disagreement and points of view and, and conflict. If we can just use a simple term like that, how do we shift? I mean, what what can teams do when dealing with multinational teams to create to move from the cultural norms and run away from those sensitivities to some sort of team norm so you can get the business done to move things forward. What's your experience? Uh, well, this is a very, very important question. I think it's very, very challenging to everyone who is working with cult uh, cross-cultural teams. I personally and strongly believe that Everyone, if all people want to be heard and respected and understood, mm. every 
being has a need to be heard, understood, and respected, no matter what, how, away from how he looks, away from where he comes from, away from his gender, away from his religion, right? Mm. So I, 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 in, in your position, if I'm dealing with a cross-cultural team, I need to be aware, of course, of cultural sensitivity. I need to be aware that there is no bullying or harassment or discrimination in my team. I need mm. to be fair and transparent with everyone and treat everyone equally, literally equally, not just to say this, but to put this in action. And I strongly believe when you do this to your team and everyone has this sense of recognition, people like to feel that there's sort of recognition when they work with, with, with yeah, for, they get it from their supervisor or boss. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, I, I, I think you will be able to reach a common ground with them. You will be able to, to sit with them on the table and to find a common ground with them mm. if you show respect and active understanding. I would say also active listening and empathetic understanding. We hear a lot of people go through some sort of training about what active or reflective listening is and such. From your perspective, you know, you know working in international environments, you've been in 50 different countries and such, and you've been, as you said, the global north, global south, the west, the east, what have you. What is listening and what specifically can we do to sort of enhance or improve it? Because everyone can listen, but not everybody listens per se. Yes, that, that is very important as well. To Not to be stuck in your own narrative. This is the most important fact. I was reading this very important book in, uh, in negotiation, like the Holy Wobbles of Moshe Kuhn. Mm. So Moshe was really arguing and stressing this on this. That of course, emo negotiation and mediation and, and cross-cultural work, it's all about emotions management. How do you manage your emotion when you are hurt, when you are angry, when you are feeling disrespected, right? Because this happened to us on even on a daily on, on a daily basis with our families, with our partners at workplace. So this importance of I asked myself first. What is my my position in this conflict? What is my role in this conflict? How do I feel about this conflict? Yes. Am I a conflict producer? I have to question this because I think we are all producing conflicts even when we aren't aware. Some people don't shout and don't fight and don't swear, but they are passive aggressive because we have different personalities and we have different communication style. What is the communication style I used with my group or with my team? Was I clear enough? Was I respectful enough? Was I very overreacting? Was I very defensive? Because there are a huge amount of people who can't deal with criticism. They have conflicting perception. How do we perceive each other's? Because I don't think anyone has the power of the definition, right? Because who has the power of the definition? I don't think nobody has it until now. If I say I have the power of the definition, it means I'm absolute right and you are completely wrong. Mm. So I assume that I'm not having the power of the definition. I assume that I need to listen carefully to, to everyone and to not to be stuck in my own narrative because people tend to be stuck in their own narrative, tend to react emotionally and in a defensive way when they know there will be a conflict or even... And also inside, I would here refer to some culture where you avoid conflicts at any cost, like being in the Arab world or being in Far East, People tend to be avoidant, whereas you would see maybe some other countries, they are confrontational with conflicts. They're totally okay to confront you and to speak, to have an open conversation. But what we have here, for example, people wouldn't confront you, but because of this fear, the extreme fear that they are going to lose this reputation or face in front of you, in front of the supervisor, in front of their family. So they tend to manipulate the truth and even not to say the truth and not to conflict with you and to keep everything covered up, which is completely unhealthy and toxic. This will lead to more conflicts at the end, right? I work with a number of, uh, of cultures and one of the ones I, I really respect are the Dutch. You know, the Dutch will are very straightforward and they will tell you what's on their mind. And it doesn't come from a, a bad place. It's they just want to clarify the air and get straight down to it. 
And what, what happens is, again, this is from my own personal experience as a Canadian working with Dutch. I actually like that. You know, I, I've become used to that because what it means is that we can move things forward. There's not sort of a hidden agenda. There's, we're not always worried about the delicate flower in the room or, you know, offending someone. Everyone has a rule that, you know, let's speak up address the issues because it's as you guys say in the negotiation when we're hard on the problem easy on the people right soft on the people but it, it's always about the problem and the people that you talk to in that dodge culture it's, it's it's confronting the problem addressing that problem and then moving forward and there's there's not a lot of what did she mean by that what did he mean by that I, I again i talk in stereotypes but one of the things from in a business aspect to move things forward or try to find a solution to a problem or an answer to a question i find this type of interaction is much more productive much more move things forward now i know obviously this does not fit with every culture but from my personal experience i find this to be a very uh a breath of fresh air when you're trying to deal with something I completely agree with you. I have the same communication style. I'm very blunt, I'm very German, I'm very straightforward even. But this doesn't work in my own country. This doesn't work in, in, in the Arab culture. We be extremely hurt when you confront them, when you say the truth. I mean, I used to, to complain and to lose my sanity a long time ago because what's wrong when I say the truth? What's wrong when I say... You have to be on time, otherwise I can't come to meet you again. For example, if in, when I deal with, with uh, government or with like uh, different institutions here at my old work, I sit with someone, we agree on certain things, right? In a meeting. For me, for Ines, I would like to put this in writing. I would like after this meeting to have formal email and action plan and clear strategy about what we are going mm. to do next. This is a huge amount of insult. And I said this once to someone and he said, this means you don't trust me and you don't respect me. If we agreed on this then we agreed on this, trust without writing, without an email, this is a sign of distrust or mistrust and disrespect. And I was really shocked because for me, it is perfectly normal to follow up by an email, action plan. I, I, I have to say again what we have agreed on. And some cases, people tend to deny what we have agreed on. I mm. haven't said this. No, 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 no. You misunderstood. Mm. That's why I like to confirm by an email. And for your culture and your background, it's perfectly normal to be blunt and straightforward. Mm. I would like even to be hurt, but to know the truth rather being manipulated. So, you're, yes, this doesn't really work, Jason, in all culture, unfortunately. Doesn't yeah, really and and. Why I, I like to talk about sort of multinational companies is that it, it forces the issue in which if we are going to collaborate, regardless of you from the east, west, north, south, or planet Mars, my point is we need to create a set of norms. If we are going to be resilient, if we are going to be able to buffer change and the unexpected as a team, as a company, as whatever, as a project group, we're going to have to get over the, some of these cultural norms and create our own norms as a group of individuals working, collaborating, communicating, cooperating together. And so I'd like to rewind again. I like to rewind a lot in this podcast. You were talking about addressing narratives. With your work, how do we address narratives? If we're going to have a hard conversation about creating some sort of team norms or, or uh, rules of engagement in our team, how do we address narratives? I mean, what has been your experience? First of all, I need to be aware, self-aware of mm. my complexity, of my psychology, of my triggers, right? I'm aware of my triggers. I know what triggers me. I know my traumas. I know my conflict. I know what does really put me in a bad mood. When I overreact, when I'm defensive, then you must have triggered something really big inside me. I have to isolate all of this and to focus on the issue and to split the difference, right? And not to focus on my narrative and my Ines background, what I have gone through in my whole life, and to put my whole focus on the narrative of the conflict parties and to put myself in his shoes and to try to imagine what he has gone through 
to be, for example, very hostile, very aggressive. We are very like uh, reluctant to any like spoiling conflict. We have studied the dividers and the spoilers in the conflict map. Some people divide, some people disconnect and spoil the deals, right? So you need to be sure if you have lots of spoilers in your meeting, if you have high conflict personalities if you're in your meeting, if you have passive aggressive people in your meeting, right? Mm. They, that might trigger me myself as a mediator or as a negotiator. So I had to be resilient. I learned how to be very strong and to differentiate between my own narrative and their own narrative. And of course, it is a process, Jason. You have mm. to practice every day sometimes i do it perfect even in my personal life sometimes i fail and it's okay not to be okay sometimes you come from a psychology background and, and you know like this fluidity of human emotions and feelings and the process of mediation and negotiation it's all about human it's all about emotions management it's all feelings and feelings and conflicting perceptions and conflicting values right because you think sometimes you, your values are the most valid and your, your values are the most correct. And, and I need to, 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 to leave my mindset and to leave my background and to be another person when I said to negotiate with someone. Well like, articulated, yes. well articulated. In communication, there is the intention of what I want to communicate. And then there's the impact of what I said on that person. And I think in multicultural teams, I think it's important that we start with a premise that everyone's intention is noble, that they are meaning well. So when Jane or James points out something that Jason's done wrong or where he dropped the ball, that I, as Jason, have to be a big boy and understand that maybe Jane and Jamie, you know, they are well-intentioned and they're giving me criticism or constructive feedback trying to help me and I have to be a big boy and stop thinking that their intentions are are nefarious that they're trying to harm me right because if from my experience and again this is just from my experience if I start with positive intention noble intention that the other person is giving me criticism in a, from a constructive and a good place where they're honest and they're sincere and genuine then yes, it, it will rub me the wrong way of course I, I, I will feel dejected or I'll feel like I got hit. But I know that their intention is, is noble and thus the impact of their words on me will have a different effect than if I'm automatically assuming from my narrative and usually it's, it's unconscious that, oh, no, Jamie's coming from a bad place. Jane's coming from a bad place. They're just trying to us usurp me or something. Does, does, does this resonate with you? Does this kind of concur with what your, this, your experience are? Really yeah, I, I have confronted this a lot. I I know I was thinking of this course I, I made in Berlin in Janusz Korczak organization of nonviolent communication. Mm. For like two or three weeks, we were, of course, big and diverse group in the course. And most of them were Germans and also mediators and training and cultural coaches. We, we were sitting and every day was really shocked by what the coach was telling us. I realized that we are all aggressive at the end. We are all judging each other because mm -hmm. when I was complaining about certain conflicts and complaining about certain behaviors made by one of my flatmates who was always producing conflicts, for example, and repeating every time we said to meet, I, I, I agree on the time, I made time to meet, for example, but she would say, I don't have time to meet for like a few months. And then the conflicts are always like there in the table and we need to reach an agreement to live in peace. Someone doesn't have time to be there. Someone, when he is there, is spoiling the, the deal. Someone is like very manipulative and provoking. And then I said to the trainer who, who was doing the course with us, my flatmate doesn't want to change. And this, he said to me, this is a hard judgment. How could you say this? If I said to you now, if I fight with you every time or argue, and then I said to you, oh, Jason, you don't want to change. You want to be like this forever. This is how you are. And then he said, this is also a violent communication. And this is a hard judgment you made on your flatmate because she might, tr she might be trying to change. She might be conflicting with herself, but she needs more time or more space. I wasn't really aware in this time that this is a hard judgment. I mean, we, we tend to judge each others and accuse. I have to be aware of accusations that I'm accusing someone 
of like certain things because accusa accusa accusations are misleading, mm. right? I, I always think the same way like you, someone has noble intentions, someone uh, want my best interest, but I wouldn't assume that everyone has the best interest and everyone depends on the context and in the type of the relation. If we are in business, Mm -hmm. uh, or in business relation, then I have to be cautious about mm -hmm. what people say around me. If it is a flatmate, if it is partner, if it's my mother, then the dynamics of the relation will be completely different, right? Mm -hmm. so there are cer certain factors that will decide the answer for this question and the type of relation itself. It is, I, I can't generalize and say this for every single situation. But at least for my nonviolent communication course, it was very, very hard for all of us, even the mediators and the trainers, the cultural trainers, to realize at the very end after three weeks, oh my God, we are all aggressive at certain points. We are all, because we are human beings, we are not engines, we are not expected. And I also, do, I wanted to dismantle this notion and norm and idea about mediators and negotiation and negotiate negotiators that they are angels they don't do mistakes uh, when i had a fight with a friend before and then he said to me this shouldn't happen this shouldn't come from a mediation background you are a mediator you are in the mediation background and this shouldn't happen and then i, I overreacted and i said to him i'm a human being i i, I have feelings, I have emotions, I feel conflicted, I overreact sometimes, I'm aggressive sometimes, like all human beings. I don't want to idealize myself and to, 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 to dominate the scene and to dominate the idea of being in this mediation. It means I don't do mistakes. Yes, I have certain knowledge and certain expertise that might be different from the average knowledge, right? But it doesn't mean I'm not going to do mistakes. In the first part of my conversation with Enos, we delved into the nuanced world of conflict, a phenomenon that wields the power to shape relationships and outcomes in both positive and negative ways. We discovered that conflict, when approached with respect and mutual search for solutions, can become a constructive force fostering growth and innovation. However, like any potential tool, conflict has its darker aspects. Excessive and extreme conflict, especially when dealing with highly confrontational personalities, while well, they can lead to detrimental outcomes. Conflict is an inherent part of human interactions. It can either be a catalyst for growth or a source of disruption. The key lies in how we approach it. Constructive conflict arises when we maintain mutual respect and work collaboratively to find solutions. However, conflict can turn negative when it becomes extreme or involves personalities resistant to compromise. Cultural context plays a significant role in shaping conflict dynamics. Cultural norms, mindsets, and hierarchical structures influence how conflict is perceived and managed. Gentle stereotypes and religious backgrounds further contribute to this complexity. In cultures with strong hierarchies such as the Global South, age and gender define respect levels. Seniority often prevails, making challenging conversations, particularly with senior males, daunting for some like our guest Enos. Cultural communication nuances add another layer. While some cultures emphasize punctuality, others adopt a more fluid sense of time. Words like yes might have different implications. Definitive in the West, yet ambiguous in certain cultures. Transitioning from cultural norms to teen norms involves fostering an environment of respect, empathy, fairness, and transparency. Now, active listening also plays a pivotal role in conflict resolution. As Enos said, it requires us to step out of our narratives and to manage our emotions effectively. Often, our reactions are driven by personal triggers. To address these, we must understand our own complexity, our psychological triggers, and our tendency to overreact. Creating unified team norms requires us to navigate through these intricate layers of cultural dynamics and personal narratives. In part two, we will dive deeper into the art of conflict mediation, the role of emotional management, and the strategies to foster cohesive teams amidst diverse perspectives and values. So let's slip back into the stream as a part two of my fascinating conversation with Enos Khalifa. have a lot of experience working in the number of countries you have you know 
if you had to give advice to women trying to navigate professional settings, would they be different to women in the West if they were working in the West as opposed to women working in the East? Or are there certain commonalities that you would give advice to? Yeah, I also, there's no one single answer for this question. Mm -hmm. It's also very complex because I would, I would advise, I would say to women in global styles that you never compromise on what you believe in. You never accept anyone to treat you poorly less than what you deserve, not to treat you equally. If a man, if you are in a, in a workplace and a man is trying to be sexist and to disregard you or to show you disrespect, you never accept this as normal because this is not normal. You have to fight for what you believe in. And I know sometimes you will never win, but at least you are trying to achieve some sort of justice and self-respect for yourself, right? There are also certain commonalities between the East and the West because... I am sorry to say this. Also in the West, there are lots of men who are disrespectful to women who are really sexist. Of course, and of course. Also dominating the scene at workplace and they, they, they show women contempt. I have seen this a lot. Mm. So I, I would say being a woman is not always advantage and being a woman is not also disadvantage because in certain societies and certain jobs, you will be hired only because you are a woman. Like Canada, for example, and the gender equality or the Nordic, they, they have this really, they, this big focus on women, right? Mm -hmm. But whereas in other countries, it's very disadvantage and it is not a privilege to be a woman. Mm -hmm. So it depends where you are, yes. And I think that's very important. You know, th this may not be so politically correct of me, but when you have hiring practices, whether it's for a corporation or an administrative practice for accepting people into certain schools, universities or colleges, and it's based on a quota system, you know, being half Chinese and half British, if, 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 if a university accepted me, not because of my qualifications, not because of my knowledge or experience of what I've contributed through my academic career, but they accepted me because I'm half Caucasian or I'm half Chinese. I mean, how is that going to be on my self-esteem? And so I think we've got to be very careful about treading this. Now, I know this is a very politically sensitive, sensitive issue, but I mean, having quota systems for me, from my perspective, I, it, it's a slippery slope. And I think it has to be very well operationally defined or what happens, it, from my perspective, it creates reverse discriminatory practices on the other end where you're, you're just, you know, you're just shunting out people just because of who they are, their gender or their race or their religion. What is your opinion on this? I just like to get it from your perspective. On the positive discrimination, you mean? Yeah, yeah, we can call I, it that. What we call it was, I mean... I, there are certain things in the world that I really can understand or can't understand sometimes. And mm. positive discrimination could be also doing injustice to others, right? Mm. Because it is not always being just and fair. It's about politics. It's about making decisions and collaboration and, and saying that, okay, Canada cares too much about women rights and gender equality and gender justice, right? Mm. So I might do injustice to men when I form these policies. I might do injustice to some minorities in the society. I might do injustice to people who have no gender identity, for example, or like mm -hmm. have problems with their gender identity. So there is no also one single answer for this question, but just I, 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 I would like very much to see people are treated equally in every sense, right? Mm -hmm. Everywhere away from this gender aspect, from the religion, from the race aspect, which is playing a big role. But uh, I think this is like one of my dreams to overarching, like in the future to dream of this equal world. Yeah. No, I, 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 I concur with you. Sometimes I think this blind hiring where you just see the qualifications, you don't see yeah. the name or the gender. Because, you know, people sometimes discriminate just on a name, Your right? If you have a certain yes. surname, name it's like, okay, yeah. forget that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is true. I mean, this happens even even here in Egypt, in global south or in Arab world. Mm. Uh, and I used to apply for jobs without like uh, attaching my photo in the CV because I don't want to be discriminated. Uh, and I don't want also others to be discriminated. If I am white, I might do injustice to a black applicant, right? 
So I, and then my friend said to me, oh no, you have to attach a photo because you are white and this will help you get hired very fast. Mm -hmm. And I was really shocked. I never know that this like being a woman, maybe pretty, maybe white, and then you, you will be like, people will approach mm -hmm. you. So this is for me, sorry, nonsense, but this is how things are in reality. And we have to accept that realities are harsh and difficult for everyone. And we are trying to just be aware of what, what mm. happens, every phenomena, every like issue in our societies. And when I try to apply even for jobs approved, mm. like I write a specific application for Switzerland with a specific CV because it's different from Germany. It's different from Austria. Even when what we call them Deutschsprachraum, like the German speaking mm. countries, but they are different. And Nordic are different and uh, English are completely different in the way they do things. So I have to be fully aware which CV I have to attach and wh whether this with a photo or without and the cover letter, what I'm writing. Sometimes I apply only in German or I send a German CV, sometimes only in French because I am German, I'm German, French educated. So uh, even the language you use, sometimes even if I apply now for the Gulf, some places ask you to write a CV in Arabic and I have never done this for my whole life. I don't know how to write a CV in Arabic. This is a nightmare. <laughs> but I, if I wanted to work in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, they might ask you in certain sectors, please write this in Arabic. This is very, very hard, even when mm -hmm. Arabic is my mother tongue. But you see with this foreign background and the education background, I speak only in English, German, French on a daily basis, which makes my Arabic sometimes very weak when I try to write an article, mm -hmm. articulate text for, for in the Arab world. Yeah. Just to shift the conversation, some of your other expertise is in areas of such as collective trauma and social codes. I was wondering, maybe you could speak a little to these 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 topics and how they play into sort of conflict resolution in the workplace or in any professional setting. Yeah, I mean, for me, trauma work is one of the most difficult and challenging work. I was working with refugees for like almost four years when I was in Germany parallel to my degrees and I worked mostly with like Syrian refugees who came from Syria at the beginning of the civil war in 2013. So, Before, I'm sorry, just to yeah. stop up, could you just briefly operationally collective trauma for myself and for the listeners, just so we, we understand what we're talking about more specifically? Yeah, and in, in every society, there are collective traumas, like collective cultural norms. For example, in, our, in some societies, they have this legacy of war when mm -hmm. like a nation like Germany uh, went to, to fight two world wars, then they have definitely the collective traumas because they have the legacy of war. Maybe they are silent as I never speak about it. It's highly, highly sensitive for them. I never speak about it with my German friends, but I could feel it when I deal with them in our conversations and the way they think it's deep rooted in the collective mind and the collective culture, right? So this is, a, I would consider this a collective trauma. Okay. Religious minorities, for example, like the Armenians or the Jews who have gone through ethnic cleansing and mm. uh, and like um, atrocities, human rights, I wouldn't say human rights violations, but human rights atrocities. Mm. They are highly traumatized. The Kurdish in Iraq or in Syria, because there was this systematic killing and, and ethnic cleansing for the race or their like uh, religious background. Those communities are extremely traumatized. And when you deal with traumatized people, there's there's trauma response, right? Mm. And there's trauma bond and there's this trauma body and mind that will shape the way you look at everything in the world. You will look through this lens of trauma. Mm. And this is lead, of course, lead to lots of conflicts. And this will make the conflict resolution very complex and hard to, to, to do at the end. And when I deal with religious minorities, as I, as I said before at the beginning of our talk, in a team, I have to be aware of his background. He might have certain traumas. He might have this trauma response, like being closed off, antisocial, not integrating with you, not sociable, not communicative, right? Mm. This will, will be a challenge for you when you deal with someone like that. Let's say someone has a team member. I'm not saying a manager or a leader has to play psychologist, but how does a layman or a lay person, how, how do you deal with someone who is coming from, let's say, a collective trauma or has a certain social code that has been based upon that collective trauma? I mean, what is your recommendation as a leader, or as a manager? How do they integrate and, and involve these individuals? 
I personally, from my own also experiences and work with refugees who have gone through a huge amount of organized mm. or larger scales of organized violence or sexual violence. Mm. And I was also working as interpreter. So I had to go to like psychotherapy sessions and to attend everything and to listen to all what they have gone through without even showing a reaction, without even allowing myself to cry over what they say, which was extremely difficult. And for me, inhumane, not to cry and not to show empathy, but this was part of my job, not to show any reaction and not to interact with what they say. I'm there only to translate, right? Mm -hmm. So those people are highly sensitive. And they have also this sort of a stigma that they are coming from a conflict zone, that they have, have gone through certain violence. So there is some sort of labels on them in the society, right? People think, ah, oh, they are traumatized. This is a stigma. Uh, I, I wouldn't like to have them in my groups, in my social groups, because they are difficult to human beings. They are really difficult. I don't want to say things in a diplomatic or a nice way. I wanted to say things correctly, right? Because we deal now with like facts on the ground. So if I have someone in my team, of course, I have to show him empathy without showing without showing him that I'm too informed about this. Yes. You see what I mean? And yes. not to emphasize this the whole time, oh, I'm so sorry for what you have gone through. This could really hurt him or her. I would show him that I have empathy with him without stressing on this. And I have to pay attention that he is hypersensitive human being. Mm. I have to pay attention not to touch on any sensitive area or wound he has. Unless he wants to open up and to talk maybe in, uh, in like other meetings or talks, he have a private talk, right? He could have a private talk with me. But just I need to be careful that he is very fragile and sensitive and easily broken. Some of them are extremely resilient. I don't want to portray them as passive victims because I even don't like saying victims of violence. I would say survivors because describing women also as victims of violence, it's very disempowering to them. And it's very arrogant to think that you have the power over someone to describe him or her as a victim, right? So I would always, I don't say victims, I would say survivors or people who have survived violence in conflict zones. And I have to be aware of this background and to not to touch on that and to be super sensitive with them. Intelligence and emotional agility is very, very important in this context. I think that's, that, that's such a, an astute point because when I was working, you know, trauma many years ago, is that it happened. If we could rewind in a race, I wish I could, but that's just wishful thinking. The question is, as you said, you know, life is sometimes harsh. Life is plays the cards and then we are dealt those cards. And the question is those who could make sense of what has happened to them to include into their life narrative, as you said, they survived and not, they're not a victim of, they survived it and it, it has shaped them and molded them in the way it does, but they try to find a way to grow to, to strengthen it again yeah, back to what you said the narrative right it's how yeah. redefining those narratives those people i who forgot got, to say that some sometimes the coping mm. mechanism is this denial mm. right not to speak about it at all not to say mm. anything and not to accept anyone to talk to you about it even with one of the refugees i was negotiating with him because I negotiated his survival. I had to negotiate it every time. He was a bit suicidal. And, and, and he had survived lots of violence. And he had to also, he practiced violence on one of his family members because both were belonging to different groups. One was with the regime, one was like against the regime. So he, he shot his sister, basically. So I had to negotiate his survival and I had to convince him not to commit suicide and to pursue his like psychotherapy sessions with his like therapist. And it was very, very hard to deal with him. I, I don't know what happened to him at the end because I moved to another city and I started another job in Berlin. So sometimes you have to negotiate your own survival. Sometimes you have also to negotiate someone else's survival, right? Yeah. Uh, and sometimes the coping mechanism, he said this to me and he said, I don't want to speak about it at all, even with my therapist. I don't know even how did I say this to you. He just forgot. And he said it out of this pressure he was living with and this guilt he is living with every day. And this is a coping mechanism being in on denial mode. 
Mm. I don't want to remember. And sometimes we wish we could forget certain trauma, tra- tra- uh, traumatizing events mm. or traumas in our life, but actually we really don't forget. We just learn how to cope with this pain, with this emotional pain, but they will knock on your doors from time to time. Yeah, and those are extreme cases that are very hard to diff- uh, deal with. And you need specialists who've been educated in that type of psychotherapy or that type of psychology to help them. When it comes to working with someone who's kind of g- gone through trauma and they've made it into some sort of professional setting, you know, to expect a manager or a leader to have those skills, well, that's just completely unrealistic. And the question is, I think it comes back to something, the human basics of regardless of religion, gender, culture, or whatever life story or life story arc that person comes down to. I think there's three things you said is to be heard, it's to be respected and to be understood. You don't have to treat them any anywhere and anything special. But if you go back down to the fundamentals of the human operating system or of us as individuals, as human beings, we want to be heard, respected and understood. And if we can keep to those fundamentals, and I think in most cases, things will run relatively smoothly. Now, again, I speak of generalities and of course, it's very situational. But I think if we bring it back down to that, psychological safety is just another word where people feel secure, they feel valued, they feel connected to the group. Then I think those are some of the fundamentals. Specific, the reason I want to bring this up is that not everybody has deep training, such as myself or yourself, even though we come from two different disciplines, Enos. What's your yeah. thoughts on that? I I think I never, of course, pretended to be a psychotherapist. I mean, mm-hmm. the man was doing his like therapy sessions with like the mm-hmm. German uh, therapist. Yeah, of course, of course. But you, you worked out. in those areas. Yeah, but I also had to touch in collective traumas mm-hmm. and trauma work in my trainings, which I found it very, very hard, even for myself, when I do this to myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we need to sometimes to confront ourselves with certain facts about our background, about us, about our like belonging. And I think all human beings like to belong to whether to a community, to society, to a certain race or a religion or a sect or a caste, whatever what we call it. Uh, and when you feel you are socially exploded as a migrant or a refugee or someone who looks different or who has different beliefs, right? then you would really feel too bad about yourself. And this is also traumatizing in itself, right? Yes, yes. So if, as you said, currently you're living in Cairo, Egypt, and you've described Egypt as a hierarchical, patriarchal society. I have a general question to you. I'm sorry? Classist as well. Classist. So how do women become more resilient in these type of hierarchical, patriarchal societies? I have never found the right answer to this, but I have tried to have diff- my own interpretations and observations as like uh, someone who is living here also like an outsider, mm. right? I, I don't feel I'm able to integrate and to belong to, to the society or the cultural norm. But what I have learned from my work experience that being really vocal about your needs and being compromiseless on disrespect and, and inequality that practiced, I mean, because I have gone through this million times that someone fights against you and accuse you of things that you haven't done because he is jealous or he's macho and sexist and want to get you out of there because you are threatening his own ego and privilege at workplace. So don't, they shouldn't compromise on this. They shouldn't accept injustice and disrespect. Um, they, if they need help, if this is getting on someone's mental health, then it's okay to go for therapy to talk about it. We have to be self-aware, very self-aware, and to read about that and to, to educate ourselves because I don't think every Egyptian woman has access to education, right? And not, I mean, I am privileged to have my education, to be able to travel everywhere, to do my trainings, to to be able to be strong, independent women. Of course, I had battles to fight to be where I am. But just to but clarify, not, you you are yeah. Egyptian yourself. Yeah. 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 Okay. Just want to just set that there. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, yeah. I am Egyptian, but I don't feel I am able to belong or to fit in the mm-hmm. narrow mind society because I don't I don't like hierarchies. I don't like patriarchal system. I don't even like class system. Mm-hmm. that disrespect others and exit loads others, right? 
So I, I personally believe that if I compromise on what I believe in, if I am af too afraid to fight against a sexist man at workplace, he will repeat this again and again. And there is this phenomena here in Egypt that people tend to have empathy with, you know, the Stockholm syndrome. Mm, Stockholm syndrome, yes. Stockholm syndrome, yeah. There are this some sort of syndromes here in Egypt, I have noticed. I mean, there's sexual harassment everywhere, even at workplace. Women will never speak about it. They will never, ever say it to anyone. They will just be silent and repressed and angry inside and resentful, but they will never say it to anyone because of the stigma. If I speak about it, then I am damaging my own reputation. So I have to keep my silence. I am outspoken. I speak about harassment. I speak about discrimination and disrespect. And I take the consequence. I'm not saying there are no consequences when you speak about certain things in 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 a reactionary society sometimes because people are always going to take the side of the man at the end because he has more power and privilege and because people might accuse you that you are not okay. He harassed you not because he is a harasser, but because of you. So they tended to take the side the side of the perpetrator, not the victim. And I, I would encourage women to speak openly about sexual harassment and to condemn this no matter what the consequences are because... When you are silent and you don't speak, there is a consequence, right? And it's getting on your mental health and your inner peace. It's, it is threatening your inner peace. And when you speak, you will take the consequence as well. So they have to be fearless. Have you come across some sort of stories or success stories where women have overcome sort of the, I don't even know how to describe it, the... The, the the violence or the the stereotypes or these 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 hierarchical patriarchal societies I, I know you spoke to some extent on some of these but I was wondering maybe if we could elaborate this yeah, because of course. There, there I think it's an important of, to topic yeah there are a lot of Egyptian feminists but they are living abroad they are not here in Egypt that is a problem so even their work maybe not be known to to average Egyptian women here that is a problem they are all Western educated they live in Geneva or in London mm -hmm. they write of course uh, very intellectual text not really addressed to everyone and this is part of, of the dilemma here I personally had to speak about this and had to confront people in their faces and to say, hello, you can't do this to me. You can't say this to me. And I would resign and I would leave my job if I don't really, if I'm not treated equally. This is my strategy. I will take the consequence no matter what. But I, I mean, the Egyptian feminist home, like Doria Shafi, for example, this was a very prominent Egyptian feminist, maybe the first feminist in Egyptian history. She was very, very famous. She wrote about women liberation. She was French educated and quite upper class. And, and this time the society was also, of course, extreme reactionary and male dominated and women weren't allowed to go to schools. They were married like this arranged marriage when they are 15 years old. And Egypt was more reactionary like 60 years ago. But at the end, she had to fight hard against reactionary people, macho and sexist men in the society. And everyone turned out to fight against her until she was isolated. She isolated herself in her own house here and she committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And this was really a tragic. I started know knowing feminism because of this woman. I wrote one of my uh, house arbeiter exams in German mm -hmm. about when I was pursuing my degree, Egyptian feminism. Uh, so some cases are like that, trying to change the norm, trying to fight hard, trying to take the consequence. But sometimes we are not heroes. We are human beings. We are weak at the end. We get tired and it gets on our mental health and we decide to end our lives, which I don't want anyone to do. Of course, I'm not encouraging anyone to do this. But if it is going to get in my mental health, then I have to stop it or to live elsewhere or to isolate myself and to form relations with people who have the same mindset, right? There's no answer key to this. I mean, it's very situational and depending upon the different forces or pressures in a person's life, yeah. you know, yeah. if they have that luxury where they can walk away from a job because of, it's, it's just not mentally healthy for them, that's, then that's the choice they have to make. If I may just shift the conversation, you know, you've worked as an expat and you've 
you've collaborated co- cross culture and teams. What are some of the valuable lessons you've picked up along the road that you've learned about effective communication and conflict resolution across cultural bo- boundaries? Now, I know we've touched a little on this, but I'd like just to maybe expand on this. Uh, this is one of the most important questions of our episode today. I strongly believe that I have learned a huge amount of lessons from like Uh, being an expat living in Germany. I lived in Dubai, lived one year in Spain in Barcelona. I lived as a child in Kuwait because my father was teaching at university there. So I have been everywhere in the Gulf and in the Arab world. And I have learned not to judge, to think, but not to judge. This, This is lesson one. I have learned to practice active understanding and to practice empathy with everyone, this emotional agility. And I have learned that people are very different, similar and different, right? Because we have commonalities, as you said before, and we have also huge cultural and religious uh, differences and backgrounds. And people react in a different way in every situation. They react, men don't react like women against traumas and conflicts, right? Mm. Because there is this also international norm that men shouldn't show emotions, especially in the Arab world, if I'm going to speak here, there is this repression of emotions. A man can't show his emotion. A man should be always a hero and super like man, super strong. He can't cry because he would be weak. He is not allowed to be depressed. So this is not, so when he reacts against conflicts or traumas, it will be completely different from women. So we, we are different in our way of coping, right? We are different in the way we react. And this is very important. I wouldn't assume that we are all the same. We don't think the same way. We don't communicate the same way. We don't build the trust the same way. We don't persuade the same way. We don't make decisions the same way, right? Hmm. We are extremely different and diverse and sometimes like parallel. In some cultures, if I want to compare it with Egyptian culture, I wouldn't find anything in common. Yes, yes. Yeah, and this is like the the value and the richness I have here in my personality that I'm able to communicate easily and like uh, without this mental pressure when I deal with uh, people who are extremely different from me. I don't feel anything bad about it. I'm very open to talk about any topics. I'm able to embrace like the constructive conflict and mm-hmm. the disagreements. I would also disagree with you in a, in a polite way and I would keep my opinion for myself, but I would allow you to disagree because I would like also to say this because this is very important. There is this culture of violence here. People don't allow you to disagree with them. There's this totalitarian mindset an authoritarian mindset. I am the only one who's right and others are wrong. And we are like we and them. And this really doesn't work. There is no one single way, universally agreed way of doing things or correct way of doing Mm -hmm. things. So I have to accept, allow others to express their own opinions, to disagree with me in a civilized way and not to attack them. Mm-hmm. I remember I was in, in sitting with the opposition, the Syrian opposition in Paris a long time ago when the war started. And they started shouting and beating each other's up when carrying the chairs and throwing them on each other's. And I was horrified by this. I always have been told that the mediator should stand near to the door because he has to run away once there's a <laughs> 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 it is have not an escape me. plan. Yeah, okay. Believe me, it is not funny to be a mediator or a negotiator. You could be beaten up and killed easily. I, I've and talked I, to a number of mediators, so that's the first time I've heard <laughs> that, that truth about that skill. That's good to hear. Have an it escape is not plan. funny. Huh? <laughs> and as a woman, and they are all quite seniors, and they belong mm-hmm. to the opposition, they don't belong to the regime, and they started shouting. And I, so I thought it's only they shout and they curse and they swear. This is mm-hmm. maximum, what I'm going to, maximum level of verbal violence, which mm-hmm. was also hard for me to accept because for me I wouldn't spit on someone's face I wouldn't do this I will be calm and collected and I would disagree with someone but this is relative from personality to another I didn't go anyway I had to ask myself shall I leave or shall I sit down shall mm-hmm. I continue 
<laughs> and I was very courageous to stay because I believe in what I'm doing and I believe I have something, some values to add to the conflict resolution arena. So sometimes you never know what is going to happen to you. People could get really angry and mad and mm. aggressive and you have to be calm and collected or you have to run away. You have a decision to make. Mm. So, so I have to be aware of this culture of violence, right? Mm. To, to have it in my background. So if I rewind, so you said some of the lessons learned across the board, across nationalities and countries and such, is to think and not judge. The second one was to have a curiosity, to have what you call proactive, proactively trying to understand them and to show empathy and to understand that as human beings, you, there's going to be commonalities, but there are differences. And sometimes those differences show up as opinions as as different points of view and it's to to listen and to question and to understand and i i think all of these are very important but i'd like just to jump into the first one think and not judge from my perspective even though i i try not to judge in my head automatically my brain is already assigned some sort of meaning but that happens automatically, like emotions. I can't stop my emotions, like anxiety, anger, frustration, overwhelm, whatever. That will pop up, but I can choose to do what I want with that emotion. I find that the same with people. And I honestly admit it, I will have a judgment about someone when I first meet them, but I try not to act on that judgment. That judgment is something that automatically stop, comes up and I can't prevent it, but I can choose to deal with that judgment. I can, through, as you call it, active understanding, see if that judgment is actually BS, that it's not really true, or maybe find... Th because if I become aware of my own judgments that I'm assigning to per person automatically, and I, I become self-aware using your terminology, then I can actually see, I don't want to go down to some sort of rabbit hole of confirmation bias, believing, oh, Jason is like that, right? Because, oh, and I'm only picking out that behavior. But how do you think and not judge I, I found it the most difficult and challenging task not to judge because I strongly believe that we are all judgmental to a certain degree, right? Mm. We judge people because we have prejudice, because we have uh, sometimes racist education, because we have uh, religions that are deep-rooted inside us that taught us when we were young that we are the only correct religion and others are completely wrong. It's, it's almost an implicit bias. Yeah. yeah. And also the Islam education, because Egypt is the dominant religion here is Islam. Mm. Uh, people think that they are the only the Muslims are only going to paradise, but Christians, the religious minority, will never go to paradise because they refuse to convert to Islam. There is this collective mindset that assumes certain things about you only because you belong to different religion or sect. You look like you are a bit black, you are a bit like white, you are maybe uh, belonging to some sort of lower classes in the society. Mm -hmm. There is this start to assume this and to judge you, which is extremely, extremely disrespectful and inhumane and retarded even for me because I would deal with you first. And then I will I will make my own like evaluation later, but I wouldn't have any prejudice. I used to be... Mm -hmm. People perceive me like in a strange way when I was in Germany, that I am a woman who is coming from Egypt or North Africa with Islam background, mm. and I'm very strong and independent. This is really abnormal for them. They expected me to behave in a certain way. And when I didn't behave in a certain way, they were really shocked. One of my professors, he was super funny and I liked him very much. He invited me to a party in his house. And then he put like alcohol for everyone. And he put like orange juice for me. And then he said, Ines, I know because you are Egyptian, you don't drink. So this uh, orange and stuff, this like orange juice is for you. I put it for you. And I felt very exploded. And I, I was laughing. And I said to him, hello, like I drink beer, I drink wine. Mm -hmm. I have no problem to drink. And he started laughing. We both started laughing because he said I was in Egypt a long time ago. And I felt people tend to be conservative. I said, yes, but drinking a glass of wine or a, mm -hmm. a beer doesn't mean that I'm not a conservative. I could be conservative on a certain mm -hmm. degree, on certain issues, but not with this maybe alcohol. Mm -hmm. you, you, you have to get to know people on a deeper level to be able to know if they are conservative or not. Uh, what's mm -hmm. like that? I never managed to follow any like religious system or a religious program for my whole life. So I'm always struggling. I don't know if what I'm doing 
is going like uh, to exclude me from being maybe religious and being a secular person. But may, my professor wouldn't know this about me. He knows I'm very open-minded and friendly and nice, but he doesn't know if I drink beer. This was, of course, nice and thoughtful of him, but sometimes it hurted me to a deeper level because this is a party and we all drank. And I felt I'm very exploded that he just put this thing for me and put it in front of me. He mm. assumed it automatically that Ines doesn't drink. Just to look at that particular example, because I think it's a very simple but a very good example to illustrate a number of things we've talked about. You know, as you said, your German professor, he was thinking about you and, and your welfare. And so though he did that, it felt exclusion or you felt excluded from that. But at the same time, you you said this guy is coming from a, a he has good intentions. He's well meant even though it hurts you, yeah. but you have the emotion of being a little hurt or excluded, but you understand that those are emotions that they're coming up. But as you try to use active understanding with him, you said, well, he's coming from a good place because he's trying to yeah, respect you. And at the same time, even though you felt hurt, you didn't go down the, tr the, the, the rabbit hole of doing that. You said, okay, I felt hurt. What I want to do with it about it. And he said, you know what? The professor came from a good place. He was well meant. But now through this experience, we this experience for both of us has taught us a lesson. It, it has expanded the latitude and the altitude of our understanding of who we are and where we come from, and that we are not sort of stereotypical in a sense. So both of you actually learned something like that. And those emotions, whether comfortable or uncomfortable for him too, obviously, because he's like, oh my God, I stepped on, I stepped on her toes in a sense. But both of you learn something from that, right? And that experience deepens the understanding and relationship. This is what I see from a sort of a objective perspective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I also had to appreciate it and to say thank you to him. Mm -hmm. I understand that it's coming from noble intention and this is like being thoughtful mm -hmm. and respecting my background. But it's also like a label on you. I felt I'm an alien in the party. Everyone mm -hmm. is drinking. Here and wine, I am sitting here with orange juice, and he even doesn't know if I drink carrying this bottle. <laughs> and I actually I enjoy drinking. <laughs> so we started just laughing and laughing, and he said, Okay, I das habe ich schon notiert in German. I just I have <laughs> in my background that next time you will get always your wine. <laughs> yeah. Every time I go to visit him, because he lots of meeting, he has like this wine in front of me and he he knew me. Well, you know, there it, it's it's a great uh, example of the three things. You know, it's thinking and not judging. And if if the judgment does come up, the emotion comes up, fine. The question but is, what do you want to do with that? And the second thing is, there was that proactive, active understanding and the empathy I hear. But at the same time, the the third point you made of commonalities and differences were made apparent. And of course, all three of these things coming back to the 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 trailhead of our conversation at the top of the hour, every human being wants to be heard, respected, and understood. And I think for any lay person trying to create a cross-cultural communication or collaboration, all these things that you've articulated today, Ines, about thinking, not judging, proactively understanding, showing empathy, understanding there's commonality and differences, but at the same time, letting people feel understood and respected or heard, that's a great amalgamation of something to do to come back to the fundamentals. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, for, for me, like the most important thing, I like to feel I am correct. And I don't like saying things in a diplomatic way. And I want to say things in a beautiful way to appease everyone. I'm not a people pleaser in general. I feel respect and understanding, but I'm not a people pleaser. I would also say my opinion, what I think about certain things. Mm -hmm. So, and I found that the balance is very, very hard to balance my, I'm very stubborn and very like sometimes ardent and opinionated mm -hmm. about Thing. not because of the mediation background but I used to be disobedient as a child and I used to be to argue a lot with my, my my parents and to be kicked from the house and to be banished and all of this nonsense but I have grown up also with this uh, difficult personality trying to question you are not allowed to question anything here mm. and as a child you want to question certain things about religion for example your parents wouldn't allow you to touch on this especially if they are very conservative. Mm -hmm. So I have grown up trying to 
question everything, politics, religions, human beings, uh, certain like big things in life and history. And I always wanted to find the answer for my questions. I wouldn't say I have found every answer for every single question until now. And I do lots of readings. I, I talk with intellectuals and with writers and I argue with them. But I have learned that there is no right and wrong in life, Jason. Hmm. There are only people who are different. Very good. I'm very respectful of our time, Ines. Is there any last thoughts, advice, or suggestions you'd like to my, to leave with my listeners today? Uh, what I want to say is, and at workplace or even outside workplace, we have to treat people nicely and kindly because we have no idea about what they have gone through in their lives. It is not really funny to practice racism or discrimination on fragile groups in your workplace or or like women because they are weak women with like a broken wing and they are like the vulnerable group in the society. So I practice my whole power, this power exercise the whole time because Egyptians are mad about power and authority. They are very authoritarian. So everyone here would like to practice this power over you, especially if you are vulnerable in the society, like women, I would say. So try to be nice in general, even without hidden agenda, because we are human beings. Try to be kind, be, because you have no idea about the battles everyone had to fight in his past to keep his sanity and to be where he is now in the present moment. Ines, thank you very much for your time today. You're very generous sharing your experience, your knowledge, and your skills that people can use. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jason, very much for having me. And I'm looking forward to hearing this episode. And uh, I, I am very interested also to follow up your amazing work. I listen to every episode. I'm trying to see the diverse guests you have. What I like about your episodes and your program that you have people with very, very diverse background and their diverse academic and professional even backgrounds, which is very rich. You are not only a monotonous per person who is only focused in the West or in one culture, because you are yourself very cosmopolitan. <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you can't hear that but through my voice, but yeah, on the screen you can see that. You are a great conversation partner because you are talented. You know how to allow people to speak and to express like without any fears. And I think you have a talent. You are you are the right one who is doing the right job. I, I wouldn't be relaxed about saying what I say, what I said today to you, because normally I like to be vague and not to stereotype and not to speak about specific things i don't want to be labeled in the future or to be compromised because i work in politics at the end mm -hmm. so but with you i felt everything was easy or super super nice and easy going and you give this friendly atmosphere jason i'm not saying this to compliment you. you this was also my dominant impression when we met first time that you are super super friendly and maybe <laughs> this is also the very like international background you have i yeah, like well thanks for that but yeah. ines thank you very much for your time and i appreciate it I, thank, thank you it was you a great conversation great. You're very welcome, Jason. Have a nice day. Well, folks, that was the brilliant and eloquent Enes Khalifa. Although Egyptian by birth, she is a woman of international experience and knowledge. So thank you, Enes. Thank you very much for me to you for spending some time with me today. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot speaking with you. You know, folks, in wrapping up this enlightening episode, I want to leave you with a thought-provoking reflection. Conflict is not an obstacle to be feared, but rather an opportunity to learn, grow, and to bridge understanding. By acknowledging the intricate dance of cultural dynamics and personal narratives, we can empower ourselves to navigate through challenges with empathy, respect, and open communication. Remember, the journey towards unified team norms starts with self-awareness and a commitment to actively listen and to understand. Each individual's unique perspective contributes to the rich tapestry of collaboration, and it's in embracing these differences that we unlock the true potential of our teams, of the people we are trying to work with. You know, on this episode, as we continue to explore the depths of personal growth, professional development, equanimity, resilience, and the art of meaningful connection, I encourage you to carry forward the insights shared by Enos today and apply them to your own journey, to your own challenges. For many of you who might be interested in contacting Enos, I will leave all her contact information in the show notes. 
Well, folks, here we are at the tail end of another episode. Just as a reminder, you can find It's an Inside Job and all platforms for podcasting. And just as a reminder, I'm constantly uploading back uh, episodes and current episodes onto the YouTube channel. So until we continue this conversation next week, I wish you all the best. Until next time, keep well, keep strong, and we'll speak soon.